It's a pleasure to talk to you, Yaki Asi, about your new book, Transcendent Kingdom. Congratulations on this achievement. Thank you so much. Thank you for, for being here with me. I read the reviews and they were so glowing that I blushed and I was not even involved. <laughs> How does it feel to have the second runaway success in a row? Um, it feels amazing. You know, you never know what to expect uh, when you are releasing a book into the world, particularly, I think, after having the previous book do so well. Um, anything could happen, it felt like. So the fact that it has been received so positively has been just incredible. Well, it has been, it has been a pleasure to, to watch it. You know, I read it in one sitting. When I saw the book, I was, I love the cover art. I thought it was so beautiful. And I read the back and I was like, this is a big book about big ideas. And I expected to kind of read it slowly, but I, from the first page, I felt like you just had me by the heart and just pulled me right through the book. So congratulations on that. But Thank I know that you. I know everyone in the world hasn't read it already, even though it may seem that way to me. So would you tell us a little bit how you came to write this book? Sure. Um, so after I finished a first draft of Homegoing, uh, my first novel, I set it aside and I started working on a short story that was just very different. Um, I wanted to write something that just kind of had a different voice, had a different subject. I wanted to kind of almost like cleanse myself of the work that I had been doing with Homegoing for so many years. Um, and so I wrote this story about a woman who was a Gerard Manley Hopkins scholar whose mother comes to stay with her. Um, and I really liked the voice of that story, but I kind of just put it aside, returned to Homegoing. That took off um, and I forgot all about the story for many years um, until I started working on Transcendent Kingdom. And this book started really with a trip to my best friend's lab. Um, she is herself a neuroscientist um, and she studies something called the neural pathways of reward seeking behavior, um, which sounds more intimidating than it is. Basically she studies addiction and depression. Um, and I found her work so fascinating and I wondered if I could write about it in some way that kind of created a narrative around this work. Um, and so when I began that project, I remembered the short story, remembered the voice of that story, um, and kind of took it as the, as the launching pad for creating this, this novel. It's so interesting. It is a novel about science that is also really a novel about the intangible, about the spirit. Gifty is a young scientist. She's in graduate school, and she's studying addiction in mice. And mm -hmm. I had no idea that mice become addicted to insure. Yes. <laughs> I thought it was just my Nana. But so the <laughs> mice are addicted to insure and she's looking at what makes them press the lever to get more. I love the part when you describe the mice, you said some mice press the lever and when they get shocked, they throw up their little hands and, and say no more. Some press it occasionally, and then there are others, no matter how many shocks will continue to press the lever. And this, of course, is giving us some insight because Gifty's brother, he died of, um, of opioid addiction. Mm. Can you talk a little bit about the way that figures? This is, it's so timely, yet so distinct. Yeah, so, so Gifty is a woman who is getting her PhD in neuroscience. She's um, working toward kind of figuring out which pathways are involved in addiction. And she's a character who, who kind of protests the idea that her personal life has anything to do with her professional life. Um, so she would never admit this. But as you read, you find out that her beloved older brother passed away um, from an, a heroin overdose when she was 11 years old. Um, and so part of her work is trying to kind of grapple with his passing um, and grapple with what it is that makes, in this case, mice keep pressing the lever even when they know that there is risk involved um, because she watched her older brother relapse time and again um, even when he had all of this love behind him, this family that really wanted him to, um, to be able to, to battle this addiction and win. Um, so she's a, she's a character who is using her research, I think, as a way of processing her own trauma and her own pain. 
and she's suffering, but her mother is also suffering. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So her mother, after her brother's passing, um, falls into the first of her major depressive episodes. She basically can't get out of bed. Um, she's so devastated by this loss. Um, she finds herself incapable of taking care of Gifty, incapable of going to work, um, just kind of doing any of the everyday things because this loss has been so great for her. Um, so she sends Gifty to Ghana for the summer while she tries to kind of collect herself. Um, and um, she does, she recovers. Um, but when we meet her at the opening of this book, um, she is falling into another depression. And so Gifty has um, brought her to come stay with her so that Gifty can take care of her. Yeah, you may, I don't know if we said this already, um, but the family in this story are, are Ghanaian immigrants and they live in Huntsville, Alabama. Yeah, exactly. So Gifty's um, parents first immigrate to America with baby Nana in tow. Um, and they end up in Huntsville, Alabama, really kind of by happenstance. It's because uh, Gifty's mother has a cousin who lives there and is attending, um, attending the university there. Um, and so they all go to Alabama, they have Gifty, um, and, and that's how she comes to grow up in Alabama. You know what, it's so funny. It is when you say the word Alabama, uh -huh. that that I hear, I hear a Southern accent in, in your speech. <laughs> it's funny because you say that about the mother, that occasionally a Southern accent pops out. So yeah. can you tell us about your own experiences in Alabama? Sure. It's really interesting to me to hear um, what people think of my accent because mostly people can't catch it until I say certain words. You said Alabama, but I have a friend who says he hears it every time I say the word when win. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I was born in Ghana. And then uh, my family immigrated to America when I was two. Um, and we came because my father was getting his PhD um, in French um, at Ohio State. So we came first to Ohio to be with him. Um, and then we lived in Illinois, Tennessee, and then Alabama. And we moved to Alabama when I was nine. And it's the place that my parents still live, my brothers still live. Um, so it's, it's the place that I think of as home, um, but uh, we didn't arrive there until a little later um, in our journey through America. But I always think that, you know, when we first got to America, we were kind of um, surrounded by other Ghanaians. Columbus, Ohio has a really large Ghanaian immigrant community. Um, and my family attended the African Christian Church, which was mostly Ghanaian and Nigerian. It kind of felt like a soft landing, like we, we continued to do all of the, the cultural things that we had done in Ghana, um, just on this pared back scale um, in America. And then each place that we moved to, there were fewer and fewer and fewer Ghanaians. Uh, and by the time we got to Huntsville, um, when I was nine, I remember there was one other Ghanaian family that lived in Meridianville, like a half an hour drive away. And we would make that drive to see them because my parents are really invested in, in community. I, I, I told you my own, my mama lives in Huntsville and mm -hmm. your mother doesn't know it, but she has a competitor. My mother was like, <laughs> there is another woman whose daughter is a novelist. I was like, I know, mama, it's fine. It's good. Oh. The more the merrier. <laughs> We'll have to connect them because my mom, I mean, my mom loves nothing more than to brag about her daughter. So I'm sure your mom loves that. Too. Oh, they can have a brag off. I, I would, <laughs> I would buy a ticket. So I was trying to actually read this. I was like, is this a Southern novel? Mm, mm, I mean, that's such a good question. Yeah. I mean, it is. So much of it takes place in the South, but there's this quality of like isolation within the novel. Like, Gifty and her family are so removed from the culture of the South because, well, A, partly because of the mother's personality. She's kind of a standoffish person. She doesn't, um, she doesn't like create community where she goes. Um, but then also partly, I think, just from other factors. They're Black in a predominantly white part of Huntsville. Um, they're Black in a predominantly white uh, church in Huntsville. Um, so I think they're kind of at this remove that that kind of distances them from Southern culture. Um, 
so it is a southern novel but it doesn't feel like as richly southern as like a Jasmine Ward novel, a Randall Keenan novel. Um, yeah, it's it's Southern with a twist, I guess. Well, you know, I was thinking about it quite a bit because Huntsville is, Huntsville is a segregated place. Yes. It is quite a segregated town. Like my mother is trying to raise money for the library on the black side of town because it's housed mm -hmm. in a trailer. And they have this wonderful plan, even a little model, how they're gonna make this state of the art library because so many of the black children don't have access to computers at home and so they need the library and i felt like it was such a different huntsville because huntsville is is such a sciencey town so i don't think it's mm. to me it wasn't a surprise that gifty ended up being a scientist because huntsville has the most what is it the most scientist per square foot of any it's got some little stat yeah. like that for a while it was the most phds per capita of any um any city in america yeah, yeah, which is mostly because of NASA um, and the university. So yeah, lots of scientists. Because of NASA, your daddy and my mama uh, bringing <laughs> to Alabama, which is not something that people really associate with, with Alabama. And so then the rest of the novel, though, is set in California. Mm -hmm. So perhaps it's a Western novel. Yeah, it's partly a Western novel. Gifty talks about how she like couldn't wait to leave her hometown. Um, and part of this journey west was the journey of her education. Um, so she, she goes to California for the first time in order to um, start this graduate program. And then the novel becomes very, I think, kind of um, entrenched in, in Western culture and in Californian culture. Um, so it is both Southern and Western. I think we're gonna, I think I'm gonna say this novel is impossible to classify because mm -hmm. it is at once a Southern novel. It is a novel of California. It is an immigrant novel in that, you know, the parents do immigrate and about, and the question of whether or not to stay. I think it's really interesting that the father returns to Ghana. Mm -hmm. Why does he go back? Yeah, I wanted to kind of, um, I wanted to kind of complicate the narrative of the American dream a little bit. You know, we always hear these stories of immigrants coming to America and working really hard and um, climbing up the ladder and, uh, and attaining and attaining and attaining. Um, but as we know, that story isn't true for so many people. Um, uh, Gifty's father and, and her mother, but um, particularly the father, comes to America kind of reluctantly. He's happy in Ghana. His wife wants to go to America because she thinks there will be more opportunity there. And he kind of allows himself to be convinced. And then he ends up here in this place. He's been dragged to, again, the white side of Huntsville. Um, he's finding himself um, just kind of in all of these racist encounters. He's finding himself having to work much harder than he had anticipated um, and not getting very far. Um, and so he's feeling the kind of misery of life here or how miserable life here can be when you're constantly working um, and not really getting any further. Um, and so he, des he decides um, that it's not worth it for him. And he, he ends up going back to Ghana. Um, and it's a narrative that I don't see as much in fiction, though I'm thinking of um, Behold the Dreamers by Mbola Mbwe, um, kind of also kind of played with this idea um, that, that there are different versions of the American dream. Um, and one version of that dream is when it is a nightmare and you, you decide you want to opt out of it and you head back to your home country. And it's not just the, the hard work and the inability to get ahead, it's also the racism. Exactly, exactly. There's a moment, there are a couple of kind of defining moments um, for Gifty's father. One is that he finds that he, um, he's been arrested or he, gets, uh, he has these confrontations with the police every time he goes to Walmart. Um, and so then he stops going and Gifty describes um, her mother talking about how she saw him kind of hunch in order to, to fit in. Um, he's a very tall man um, and he notices other people's perception of him and starts to try to kind of um, shape himself to be smaller. Um, and then the second instance is while watching Gifty's brother um, play sports, um, 
they the family gets uh, called a racial slur um and he 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 kind of can't take that he can't like compute that this is happening to him um and so these two kind of marked incidents incidents are the things that i think um become the straw that breaks the camel's back for him um i think as a person who grew up in this country Ghana, where he never had to um, encounter race in this way or think about his race because everyone was uh, was black. Um, it becomes a shock to have that that level of visibility. And so he returns, and it's interesting you said this because in Ghana everyone was black, mm -hmm. but it's kind of there's a moment quite early in the text when the mother, when she first arrives. Um, the memory of the mother is she has strong feelings about the different ethnic groups in Ghana because because everyone's black then it becomes about the subset she refuses to speak is she, she refuses refuses to speak twi yeah or is it yeah. her grandmother it's her grandmother yes yeah that's that's right I mean every everywhere um, everywhere in the world like people create their divisions um, and in Ghana it just happens to be along ethnic lines and so um, Gifty's, Gifty's really the the product of an inter-ethnic relationship. Her father is Ashanti and her mother is Fanti. Um, and her grandmother, her maternal grandmother, um, who lived in Kumasi, which is the Ashanti capital, um, refused to speak Chui for her entire life there. She continued to speak Fanti. Um, and, and this is the way that you kind of see the divisions within that country. Um, so race wasn't the thing, but, but ethnicity was. Um, so I think Gifty's father is learning about race, deciding that he'd rather go back to the place where he understood the divisions. Yes, and I'm assuming also enjoyed a better position. Yes, yes, exactly. Because it's not, the thing about racism, like I feel like I understand racism, mm. but the understanding of it has brought me no comfort. Right. Um, one of my, well, there's a scholar, um, Rache Richardson, who said, to be the mule in the world and know exactly why is no help. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Yes. Yeah, so I think it's not so much that he doesn't understand it. It's that he doesn't yeah. like it. Yeah. Yeah. But I was surprised that he left his beloved son, because this seems to be a world in which the son, the son, these people seem like emotionally, they spell son with the U. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I think you're right. I mean, he he is the world to them. Um, earlier, you kind of learn about how hard it was for Gifty's mother to conceive, um, how she prayed and prayed and prayed, and Nana was the result of this prayer. And I think, um, and you feel that, you feel how big his presence is in their lives. And so um, when when Gifty's father goes back home, he is abandoning the family, yes, but specifically he is abandoning this son who means everything to him. There's a point later in the novel um, where Gifty's mother reveals um, that the father um, had wanted to bring Nana to Ghana with him and that she had put her foot down. Um, and it's a point where she's regretting that decision because she wonders if she had sent Nana to live with his father would he still be alive today? Would he have succumbed to his addiction? Um, so from that, you you do learn that that Gifty's father fought for Nana a little bit, um, but but clearly not enough. And did he fight for Gifty? And yeah, that remains that remains unsaid. I think she's a she's a character who who recognizes her position within this family. She talks about how Nana was the true gift. Um, she has this name, Gifty, but she knows that to her parents, to her family, Nana was the real gift. Um, and she was kind of always left um, just a, a little bit un untended, uncared for, except for from Nana, um, who loved her kind of um, unconditionally and gave her, provided her with um, all of the attention and um, the care that she was seeking from the rest of her family. And so his loss means a great deal to her as well, because he was the only person in her family, I think, who kind of showed her that, um, showed her that she herself was a gift. 
Yeah, I felt like she never quite understood that this hierarchy wasn't right. I think because Nana was so just lovable, like he was the golden preferred child and he was also wonderful. Mm, so yeah. it seemed like Hit's very self didn't interrogate that idea. Right. But I felt, I mean, it's the way you wrote this was so interesting. Like you just slip in there at the end of a paragraph somewhere. I had a little sticky in my book, but it's fallen out. It says, th there it is um, at the end of chapter six, my brother died of a heroin overdose three months later. It's just so, mm. it's so matter of fact. But Gifty's work is about how much, what is the extent to which we have a choice? Like her mother's depression. I think when we say, when people say someone has depression, I don't think people get the weight of what happened to her mother. She wasn't mm. like a little bummed. Mm. She didn't get out of bed. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Gifty is interested in um, kind of changing or or just opening up conversations around the stigmas that we put on people who are suffering from various mental illnesses. Um, she recognizes that her mother isn't going through just like a period of sadness. This is a debilitating disease. Her mother cannot, um, to use Gifty's kind of scientific terms, her mother cannot seek reward. She can't like seek out pleasure even though she wants to. She is the opposite of those mice that are pressing the lever. Um, she's the mouse who can't press the lever at all, um, no matter what the, the gift is, no matter what the, the reward is. Um, and I think Gifty sees these things as existing on a spectrum. Her brother's addiction, um, which was um, also a disease, also debilitating, but characterized by um, a continuation of seeking pleasure. Um, and then her mother's depression, um, which is, uh, which just kind of casts her into this, this state of inertia. She can't move. Um, and it's, it exists, I think, in Gifty's mind on the same plane. And it doesn't help that this is not an incredibly affectionate family. They regard um, saying, I love you as white people's foolishness. Yes. <laughs> it's <laughs> true. Which made, I was like, ooh, diaspora is real. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so true. <laughs> but yeah, but there's this sense that, that that affection and that that is a, a indulgence. Like there's so mm -hmm. many moments where the family, the parents are just stunned by American extraness and waste. The mm. idea that you would take an orange wedge and suck the juice out and throw it away without eating all of it. Yeah. The, yeah. Um, the children making the macaroni necklace. And the father is like, what is this, food and necklace? <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah, they're, they're not accustomed to the kind of, I don't know, the like exuberance of American culture. Like they're very kind of button down people. They don't... Um, there's a scene in the novel where um, uh, the janitor at the at the high school where Nana plays basketball notices that Gifty just says good job to him after his basketball yeah. game and doesn't like hug him. And the janitor says, why don't you give your sister a hug? And Nana just kind of shrugs him off. And then they're walking home and Gifty, Gifty's kind of like, I, maybe I do want to hug, you know? And Nana says, okay, do you want me to hug you? And she decides, <laughs> uh, no, maybe not. Um, but I think those are the moments where we, you see that distance between the way that these children have learned how to carry themselves because of the way their parents carry themselves um, and the way the world around them carries themselves. And so there's always this kind of push and pull between Western culture and Ghanaian culture, there's this other moment where Gifty's mom, um, who won't admit to her depression or never calls her depression depression, says something like, mental illness is a, is a Western invention. Um, clearly that's not true, um, but there is this way, I think, of, um, of using kind of the, your culture as an excuse to not learn about what, what kind of nice elements of the new culture um, you might be able to adopt or take with you are. You know, I was thinking too how, 
I think that very few people are willing to admit to having mental illness. I think that marginalized people, we all think that, oh, we, it, we just don't admit it, but really mm. debilitating mental illness. I don't think yeah. hardly anyone admits it. Whenever anyone does, it's such a moment of bravery because mm. the stigma, and people don't understand it. And if you say you have a mental illness, people will think that you are dangerous. It's just so many things happening yeah. here in this book. I, I really loved it. And I, I want to stress what a pleasurable read it was, because I think that when we're here and we're talking about people dying of overdoses, people can't get out of their bed, people experimenting right. with mice, it, this book is so much more than the sum of its parts. Mm -hmm. um, I was really intrigued by the discussions of religion, the, the way that religion is discussed, because the mother is extreme in, in a Pentecostal church in Alabama. That's a lot. But, and the religion can be oppressive, but at the same time, you can also see the way the religion also fortifies. And then with Gifty as a scientist, having been reared in a religious family, she's kind of, she's between a lot of worlds. Yeah, yeah. What, what can you explain the title to us? Sure. Um, so the title uh, itself comes from this moment early on in the novel um, where Gifty is recalling a teacher that she had who said that um, humans are the only animal um, who have transcended their kingdom. Um, and she means like kingdom animalia, kingdom. Um, but Gifty, I think, takes this to think about the fact that um, humans herself in particular are this animal who, who are attempting to kind of ask these transcendent questions. So she's interested in the mysteries of the universe. She's interested in why are we here? Why do we suffer? Um, what can we do with our pain? How can we make sense of a world in which senseless things happen? Um, all of these like burning questions inside um, that feel kind of beyond the scope of, of just any animal. It feels like particularly human. Um, and I think in that way, kind of for Gifty, um, particularly uh, difficult to, to address. Um, so for her, the way to kind of ask these questions or the way that she has asked these questions um, first in her childhood was through religion. She was an incredibly pious child raised by an incredibly pious woman um, in this church in Alabama and she really believed um, and when her brother died it shook the foundation of that belief. She found that she couldn't um, she couldn't kind of hold on to the same ideas that she held because this loss felt so cruel to her. Um, and I think that's the point where she starts to kind of turn to the science to try to address some of these questions about why she lost her brother. Um, but as she says at the end of the book, the brain could only tell her where and how, it could not answer why. Um, and so I think this is very much a book about a woman who um, is incredibly curious, wants to know um, how to deal with this life that has given her so much loss um, and has used science and religion as a way of thinking about both of those things. And it's a book about love. It is really a book about love, about the incredible capacity people have for love and the way that love can heal. I mean, so many things have happened to her, but love and I don't only mean romantic love, I mean connection, I mean love for her mother and love of her own mind. Yeah, absolutely, like, absolutely. You know, ironically, you say, oh, you can't think your way out of emotional things, but her mind allows her to open her heart. Mm. It is a most, it is a most, it is a most amazing story. I want to ask you a little bit about your process. I have two things I want. I want to ask you a little bit about your process. And then I want to ask you, of course, for advice for people who would like to write. There are so many people who have a story who think they can't write it or they should write it. They don't know where to start. Here you are, just such an example. So for, let's start with that. What advice would you give people who, who want to write? Mm. 
Well, my first advice, which sounds simple, but isn't, I think, is to just read as much as possible. Um, I think the more that I read, the more I kind of encounter literature that moves me, um, the more that I start to wrap my head around what it is that I'm trying to do when I'm writing. Um, so from a perspective of kind of getting the creative juices flowing, I think there's, there's never any better solution than reading. Uh, but from the perspective of like how to actually start, um, I find that I, that it helps to kind of give yourself these um, constraints or boundaries in the, in the beginning, just to, to allow yourself to get that engine moving. Um, for home going, I, I set out to write 400 words a day. Um, and 400 was like a nice manageable amount because um, I often didn't hit the 400 word mark, but if I got to like 350, I would still feel proud. Um, and then if I went over, I would feel exuberant. So, um, so give yourself a small goal that you can just do um, as, as quickly as possible. Um, give yourself goals that you know that you'll be able to meet um, and carve out time as much as you can every day to do this. So if it's just 20 minutes before work, if it's 20 minutes after you put the kids to bed, like whatever it is, give yourself, allow yourself that time to devote to your art um, because all of those minutes add up. And I, I had a teacher in college who used to say like a page a day, you will, you will finish a book in a year, you know? Um, and it doesn't always feel possible when you're in the middle of a project to think about it that way. It feels so big and, um, and unmanageable, but really like, slow and steady will get you there. I was wondering, would you be willing to give us a little bit of a reading from Transcendent Kingdom to wrap up? Yes, I would love to. Um, and I'll just read from the very beginning so no one has to worry about spoilers. Whenever I think of my mother, I picture a queen-sized bed with her lying in it, a practice stillness filling the room. For months on end, she colonized that bed like a virus, the first time when I was a child, and then, get, then again when I was a graduate student. The first time, I was sent to Ghana to wait her out. While there, I was walking through Kejitia Market with my aunt when she grabbed my arm and pointed. Look, a crazy person, she said in Chui. Do you see a crazy person? I was mortified. My aunt was speaking so loudly, and the man, tall with dust caked into his dreadlocks, was within earshot. I see, I see, I answered in a low hiss. The man continued past us, mumbling to himself as he waved his hands about in gestures that only he could understand. My aunt nodded, satisfied, and we kept walking past the hordes of people gathered in that agoraphobia-inducing market until we reached the stall where we would spend the rest of the morning attempting to sell knockoff handbags. In my three months there, we sold only four bags. Even now, I don't completely understand why my aunt singled the man out to me. Maybe she thought there were no crazy people in America, that I had never seen one before. Or maybe she was thinking about my mother, about the real reason I was stuck in Ghana that summer, sweating in a stall with an aunt I hardly knew while my mother healed at home in Alabama. I was 11 and I could see that my mother wasn't sick, not in the ways that I was used to. I didn't understand what my mother needed healing from. I didn't understand but I did, and my embarrassment at my aunt's loud gesture had as much to do with my understanding as it did with the man who had passed us by. My aunt was saying that, that is what crazy looks like, but instead, what I heard was my mother's name. What I saw was my mother's face, still as lake water, the pastor's hand resting gently on her forehead, his prayer a light hum that made the room buzz. I'm not sure I know what crazy looks like, 
But even today, when I hear the word, I picture a split screen, the dreadlocked man and Kejitia on one side, my mother lying in bed on the other. I think about how no one at all reacted to that man in the market, not in fear or disgust, nothing, save my aunt who wanted me to look. He was, it seemed to me, at perfect peace, even as he gesticulated wildly, even as he mumbled. But my mother in her bed, infinitely still, was wild inside. I want to thank you for having this conversation. And I would like to urge everyone to order a Transcendent Kingdom from Left Bank Books, who is our bookseller for this event. And please support your local independent bookstores. You know, it's the independent bookstores that support the writers you love. It's the independent bookstores who have extended their hands to writers who are coming up, writers you haven't heard of. You know, the algorithm thinks it knows you and says you might like this, but your independent bookstore knows what you're going to love because that is a book chosen for you, a human being, by another human being. So do the right thing and order this book from Left Bank Books. Thank you again, y'all. This has been a pleasure talking to you. And um, I think I'm gonna have to send you a typewriter. <laughs> Thank you, Tayari. The pleasure is all mine. <laughs>